The scripture reading for this morning comes from 1 Kings. I'll be reading in chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. So we're continuing our read through uh, from Saul to David uh, and now to Solomon. Uh, So let us turn to God in prayer as we come to hear God's word read and interpreted. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would quiet our racing minds, our anxious hearts, bring us into a place of stillness, of openness, of readiness to hear your word in a new way spoken into our lives. Open us to hear your word, whether it come through the words of Scripture, through words that I share around those words, despite those words, however you would choose to speak to us this morning. We pray that you would open our hearts to receive and respond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so Solomon made an alliance, a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord walking in, his statutes, uh, in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uh, uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been seen before, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. Thanks be to God for the reading and the hearing and the meditation of God's word. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, what if you were granted one wish? What would you wish for? Anything. One wish. Maybe a a genie pops out of a, a lamp that you rub and offers you the fulfillment of anything you wish for. That that, uh, image of a a genie coming out of a bottle turns out goes back a little over 300 years when the 
uh, Frenchman Antoine uh, Galland, uh, not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he translated Arabian Nights into French. And he embellished some of the stories and added his own uh, stories as he made the translation. So this whole thing of Aladdin and a genie coming out of a lamp uh, was not originally in Arabian Nights as it was written, but was something embellished uh, by him. But it's a fascinating thought experiment, right? You get the wish of your heart, one wish, and you can't ask for more wishes. That doesn't count. What do you wish for? It invites us to think about what matters most to us. What seems most important to use that one wish on? It also invites us to think about well, what's primary, what's foundational, and what's kind of derivative? So, for example, if you wanted a really nice house and you also wanted a really nice car, you don't have to make a choice between the two because those are derivative. You can ask for money enough for both of those. Or maybe you ask for a job, a good job and longevity in that job so that you can work to have the money for those things. Or maybe you realize that, well, in order to have longevity and a good job, I'm going to need good health. And so you pray for good health. And then you get thinking, in order to have good health, I'm going to need to be part of a good community, friends, family that are supportive. And you start getting deeper and deeper to what, what's really foundational for me. This thought experiment, though, doesn't just go back to Arabian Nights because this is something, not with the genie in the bottle, but this is something that was on the minds of the, the people of Israel as they told the stories about their history and, and as they reached final written form probably during or just after the Babylonian exile. And within those stories is the story of Solomon having a dream that God said, ask me for whatever you wish. Ask what I should give you. And Solomon in verse 9 replies, give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? And it turned out that Solomon responded to the test, the challenge, with flying colors. He asked for the right thing, at least in his dream. He asked for the right thing, and God responded, saying that this is something that he would have, that, he would be, that there would be no king like him afterwards that had anywhere near the wisdom of Solomon. The bad news, sometimes when you get a genie and ask for a wish, you find out that there's bad news associated with your wish. The, the bad news is the kings after Solomon, they didn't give a lot of competition, let's say. There weren't a lot of good ones that followed after Solomon. Nevertheless, well done, Solomon. He asked for a good thing. He could have asked other good things, but the one that he asked for was good and he was rewarded for it in his dream. And, and yet Solomon's request for, for this wisdom, for this understanding, for this ability to discern between good and evil, as important as that is for a political leader like a king who has people coming to them all the time with mixed motives, evil motives, trying to get something out of them, trying to pull them in this way or that. It, it's also the kind of thing most of us pray about from time to time, maybe even repeatedly. We find ourselves, for example, in a situation where there's drama among our friends at school. And we feel pulled in the midst of that drama. Some people saying one thing, some saying another, trying to pull us onto their side one way or another. And we don't want anyone to be hurt, and yet we also want to figure out how to deal with that. And we may find ourselves going, God, help me. 
how do I deal with this situation? How do I respond in this situation? Perhaps we find ourselves in a job where in that job, the decisions we make can impact other people. Those decisions can lead to the success or the well-being of a business, for example. Uh, those decisions that we make, the way we utilize our time, uh, can, can make life better or worse for our coworkers, can make things safer or less safe for our coworkers. And we find ourselves in situations where we go, oh God, help me, I'm not sure I know how to use my time today. I don't know that I know how to make this decision and what will be best in the long run. When we become parents, we feel the responsibility and the weight of what it means to care for a child that's completely dependent on us in their early years and increasingly become independent, but there's that struggle between how much independence do we give and how much guidance do we give and how much do we hold close and how much do we allow them to move and grow and make their own decisions and live with the consequences of it. And, and parenting involves lots of these times where we go, oh Lord, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what to do now. Lead me forward. Help me to know the best way to respond in this situation. Perhaps we're in a situation where a friend is in a difficult situation. Maybe we find ourselves needing to participate in an intervention or needing to call for one. Maybe we have a friend who is going through a mental health crisis and, and we're the person they turn to or we're the person who notices it. And we need to help get our friend to help. There are times that we don't know exactly what to do or what to say. And we pray to God, oh, give us understanding of how to respond in this situation. Give us discernment. And so in our own ways, we pray Solomon's prayer repeatedly in our lives, seeking to have God guide us when we don't know how to take that next step, how to make that next decision. As I said earlier, there were many other things that Solomon could have prayed for, but understanding and discernment were good things to ask for. However, if we follow Solomon's life, it was a dream, right? And God did not grant Solomon wisdom as though it were a superpower. Solomon's wisdom was not like Superman's strength. It was more like David's faithfulness that Solomon talked about early. David was deeply faithful to God. David did what was right in the sight of God. Except when he didn't. And he could extravagantly go astray. And so likewise, Solomon was deeply wise. More wise than any of the kings that followed him. Though again, not really that high of a bar. But we remember the story about the two prostitutes who had infants. One of them died. Uh, that woman took the child of the other and claimed it as her own, switched out the babies, her dead baby, into the, the crib of the other woman. And how Solomon passed judgment when they were brought to him, saying, cut the baby in half so they can each have half a baby. And the true mother of the child said, no, let her rape, because the true mother of the child would rather have the child alive than cut in half, whereas the one who was grieving and had done this horrible thing was fine with that. So we hear stories of his wisdom, and yet there's foreshadowing at the very beginning of this passage where it talks about this marriage alliance that he made with Pharaoh by marrying, marrying Pharaoh's daughter, bringing in uh, a woman 
for expediency. Not a great way to start a marriage. Uh, also, a woman who would bring her gods and her understandings into the palace. And maybe if he had stopped there, he could have made that work. But Solomon collected wives and concubines. He began to fulfill the warning that was given to Samuel that kings would take and take and take and take. Not only did he collect women from all over the kingdom and neighboring kingdoms, but he also collected taxes in a way that was so burdensome for the people that shortly after Solomon's death, the kingdom split in half. So again, wisdom. And there's much we can learn from Solomon, but not Superman superpower wisdom that is wisdom all the time. And so what do we learn from this text? The, the things that jumped out to me were first that when Solomon is given this opportunity to ask for something from God, he asks wisely, in a sense, showing the wisdom there before he's even granted it, asking for understanding to lead the people in discernment to be able to know good from evil. It's not always clear at all. The second thing was that it was interesting to me that this response from God in the, prayer, in the, in the dream in verses 11 and 12, it, it seems instructive. It says, God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been seen before, and no one like you shall arise after you. So there are three things that are listed here that Solomon did not ask for. And I, I think they're instructive to every generation. Three things perhaps that we shouldn't ask for when we get the opportunity to ask for our greatest wishes. The first one is long life. Solomon didn't ask for long life. Love Dr. King's words that he would love to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not fearing any man. See, when we are focused on longevity, when that is the highest goal for us, we become excessively cautious. We're concerned about anything that might harm us or shorten our lives. We become fearful. We lack courage. Our efforts to preserve ourselves become consuming for us whether it's efforts to preserve our lives, efforts to preserve our sense of security, efforts to preserve our sense of well-being, we become self-absorbed, all stemming from that desire for, for long life. And so rather than desiring long life, we're invited to desire life close to God, serving as God calls us, whether that leads to longevity or not being close to God, serving as God would have us serve in the world. A second thing that Solomon did not ask for uh, was riches. And riches, like I said, you know, you can get the house and the car with riches. But when riches become consuming for us, when that is the thing that matters most to us, there's a tendency for our integrity to suffer along the way for our concern for others to suffer along the way. The desert mystics, in talking about greed, had a, a different way of looking at it. Uh, for, for them, the desire to consume and bring in and have more and more and more uh, was about gluttony. When they talked about greed, what, what they were talking about was the resentment that we can feel towards people who have less and, and what their need 
calls from us or, or demands from us. We, we look at, at people who are uh, in, in need of assistance, uh, people who, whose lives have not gone as well, and, and they're a burden to us when we're consumed with greed. And, and so riches was not something that Solomon uh, asked for. The third thing was the life of his enemies. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies. Uh, most of us probably think enemies. I'm not sure that that word really applies. I, I don't know that I have enemies. Now, there may be people that I don't care for very much. There may be people that I disagree with. There may be people that I'd rather not spend time with. There, there may be people I have broken relationships with. But if we think about people for whom something not so good happening to them wouldn't break our hearts, might even get a little excited about thinking of something bad happening. That, that, that's the kind of thing we're, we're talking about here. And... and when we desire bad things to happen to others, when we want to see their downfall, their humiliation, a noxious weed is growing inside of us that, that chokes out the seed of love. And so he didn't ask for long life or for riches or for the life of his enemies. He asked instead for understanding, for discernment. I think it's a fascinating story to draw us into this, this thought experiment of what would I ask for? And maybe not only what would I ask for, but what am I living for? How am I expending my life? What are the priorities that drive me? What are the things that I care most about? What are the things that I work towards the most? And is that where I want my life to be focused? Is that where God wants my life to be focused? If not, what might it look like to refocus my life around the things that God would have for me? Let us pray. Holy God, microscopes have both a coarse focus and a fine focus. And sometimes as the one who directs our seeing, you need to make a coarse adjustment for us, helping us to see far more clearly than we've been seeing. Sometimes the change in focus that is needed is, is more of a fine-tuning. But as the broken individuals we are, our vision is never as acute as it could be. And so we pray that you would continue your work in our lives, bringing our purpose, our energies, our efforts into greater focus so that the way we expend our lives may be to bring glory to you, to help others be able to experience your love and your grace, to bring about your justice in our communities and in our world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.